Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the Larakia La La people as the traditional owners of the Darwin region. We pay our respects to the Larakia elders past and present. So first of all, let me ask, how many in this room have been implementing IPE? Can we have a show of hands? It's not 50%. You know, kidding aside. No, just kidding. I was hoping that there would be more who would raise their hands and say that, yes, we're doing IPE, because then I would have been done with my keynote. <laughs> anyway, I know that each one of us in this room may have our own stories to tell. Did I click it already? To tell about IPE, which you can share in your small discussions in the next four days that we are here in the conference. But it is my hope that when we go home by the end of the week, one of the key messages we will take home with us is that interprofessional collaboration in both education and practice is the way to go if we are to make greater impact in achieving better health outcomes. So while IPE, no, we've heard IPE has been talked a lot about, but not many have embraced it. Neither are there any investments or there's very little investment in IPE, be it in teaching, in service, or in research. So I would like to begin my presentation with a short video. This was produced by the College of Medicine in the University of the Philippines. And it, we also used it with the Zwillig Family Foundation in the training, leadership of training of our local health local chief executives and health leaders. In school at where I work, we also use this to teach our students on concepts of urban primary health care, systems thinking, uh, stakeholder analysis, discussions on the six building blocks for health, as well as the social determinants for health. So let me first show this film. The village of Tanyong lies in the curve of the Malabon Navotas River. On a total land area of 5 hectares lives a population of 12,400 individuals or 1,850 families. To reach the riverside houses of Tanyong, one has to cross unsteady makeshift wooden bridges. It is not uncommon to hear of children falling into the murky black waters of the river. A survey revealed that only 10% of the households have toilets. The remaining 90% use the river to dispose of human wastes. Only 10% avail of water piped into their houses. 90% buy water from entrepreneurs who fetch water from only two deep wells in the village. Five gallons of water cost between 15 and 30 pesos, depending on the distance of the consumer's dwelling from either well. No one living in Tanyong owns their home or the land they live on. Rent is 500 to 1,000 pesos a month for a small room, and a bigger room costs up to 1,500 to 2,000 pesos per month. Jaime and his family live in the village of Tanyong. He was among the 70% of the population who migrated to Metro Manila from the provinces looking for a better life. A former peasant farmer, he now earns 165 pesos a day working hard labor at a construction site in Quezon City. Jaime and his wife Lucy can afford only 50 pesos a day to feed themselves and their four children. Jocelyn, five years old. Marites, four years old. Antonio, two and a half years old. And Rosario, a year and four months old. Lucy tries her best to provide three meals a day, often skipping meals herself to feed her children. Instead of a good life, 
Jaime and Lucy found themselves chronically in debt. Lucy graduated from high school, unlike Jaime, who completed only three years of elementary education. Neither of them learned the proper ways of caring for children. When the eldest child was still a baby, Lucy was told by a physician not to breastfeed her child. She was told to buy an infant formula instead. All the children were raised on condensed milk because this was cheaper than formula milk. Lucy had no idea of proper nutrition for her children. As a result, all the children were malnourished. They were sickly, prone to respiratory tract infections, and frequently had fever and diarrhea. They frequently passed worms with their feces. Lucy thought this was a good sign. She believed that worms aided in the digestion of food. The two youngest children, Antonio and Rosario, did not receive vaccinations. The Barangay Health Center no longer had free vaccines for all the children in the village. Rosario, the youngest, was the sickliest among their children. She was very thin, pale, and invariably suffered from diarrhea. One day, Rosario contracted measles. Lucy brought Rosario to the nearest public health center where consultation was free. The nurse in the center, however, told Lucy that the center had finished the year's budget allotment for free medicines. The Barangay Health Center's request for a larger budget for more medicines had been turned down by the city council. This was because the council suspected misuse of funds by the municipal health officer and by the mayor. Lucy decided to buy a bottle each of the medicines prescribed for Rosario. Carbocystine for the cough at 109 pesos a bottle, a diarrhea medicine at 243 pesos a bottle, and an antibiotic at 150 pesos a bottle. After she finished the medicine, Rosario was still very ill. But the couple could no longer afford to buy more medicines for their child. Rosario's condition grew worse. Jaime and Lucy brought Rosario back to the health center, but were advised to bring her to a private hospital. After only one night, their bills piled up to 4,125 pesos. The couple decided to take Rosario home against the doctor's advice. Jaime and Lucy were told to bring Rosario back to the hospital once they had enough money to pay for services. After one week of continuous fever and diarrhea, Rosario continued to suffer dehydration. She became severely weakened and eventually died. Why did Rosario die? Why did Rosario die? For us as health professionals with a largely biomedical orientation, it would be probably easy for us to identify and say, Rosario died of dehydration due to diarrhea, she died of measles, and all other comorbid conditions. But if we look deeply into the story, there are more stories behind Rosario's death. Some are related to weak health systems, poor governance that was ridden by corruption, the lack of financing, poor access to medicine, inadequate health human resource, both in quality and quantity, and poor service delivery. Education, housing, water, sanitation, and poverty were also among the factors that all contributed to Rosario's death. So why did she die? 
This is this slide shows the work of my students. This is the output of my students when they tried to analyze why Rosario died. The systems affected and the stakeholders that they would need to engage um, in order to prevent more Rosarios from dying. That is why you have several meta cards there because the first meta card was supposed to identify the, what building block needed to be strengthened or was affected. The second meta card was supposed to identify who are the stakeholders that they're supposed to engage. The first, the blue one, by the way, were the causes. Were the causes. And then they had the yellow one, which was the six building blocks or systems that were affected. And then the green ones were the stakeholders that they would have to engage in order to prevent more Rosarios from dying. You know, when my students started to make their presentations, they were so confused because of all the arrows. The drawing in itself was so complex with all the arrows showing the relationships. They just didn't seem to know where to start. The story of Rosario brings to the fore the complexity of our health and social challenges and how intertwined all these are. They just cannot be addressed by a single profession or sector. While intravenous fluids, good health services, medicines, if they were available, would have allowed Rosario to survive. But even if she did, re returning Rosario to the sick system where she came from will only repeat the cycle. So what good does it do to treat a person's illness if only to send them back to the community that made them sick? As health practitioners, we were taught simple water treatment at home, but we were not taught how to build water systems that could supply safe water to communities. We do health education, but would that be enough to overhaul the entire educational system that failed to educate our mothers? Can we provide livelihood to address poverty that has prevented them from finishing school and finding employment to provide for their family's needs. There are too many fact related factors and social determinants that must be addressed. There are too many stakeholders that must be engaged. Should we let more Rosarios die because we have been learning and practicing in silos? I guess the answer would be definitely we cannot do it alone. But yes, we can talk and communicate and dialogue with each other, with other professions and stakeholders. We can learn about and from each other and work towards achieving better health outcomes, which is, in essence, interprofessional education. Today, I would like to share with you some of the experience we have gone through in the Philippines in both health profession and edu education and practice that has gone beyond collaboration among ourselves as health professionals. When the training for health equity began in 2008, way back 2008 in Cuba. I was then dean of the School of Health Sciences, which was one of the founding schools of the NET. Where are we located? We're located in Leyte, if you remember. This is central Philippines. If you remember, this was the region that was hardest hit by Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. Everyone in the group was a doctor. As I was introduced, I am a nurse. Everyone in the group was a doctor except me and Bjorg, who was a journalist. But we all share the same passion for social accountability and health equity. But in the process of the discussion, I felt everything was so doctor and medical education focused. Nobody was talking about the entire health workforce. 
right from the beginning of that very first NET meeting, I've always spoken out and questioned, with apologies to the physicians, why so much focus was placed on the physicians and medical education. Achieving health is a responsibility of a whole health workforce, and not only that, but the communities themselves who are affected by the problem. They also need to be empowered and to participate in their own health care. With the social determinants of health, the non-health sectors also need to be engaged. At that time, I tried to understand where they were coming from, but I guess not only for medicine, but all the other health profession, it's something that is historical. We all have been learning in silos. There has, so much, there has been so much exclusivity in the way health professions education has been conducted. Our health education hardly prepared us to function as members of professional teams in the future. When the NEP started, we were focused on, social, on our social accountability mandate. I remember the WHO document that was published by the WHO and written by Dr. Charles Bolen. Yeah, at, but at that time, we were so focused on that, we didn't even realize that we were already an interprofessional group working together when we developed that evaluation framework. So it started as a framework for evaluating social accountability in medical education. But the net has moved on and embraced the other health professions. So now we don't call it SAM, same, which we called it initially. We now call it SAPE, or Socially Accountable Health Professions Education, recognizing that health is a responsibility of a health workforce. I also got to be part of the conference. Okay. I, also got, I was lucky also to be part of the international reference group that contributed to the development of the global consensus, uh, global consensus for social accountability in medical education. We went through a three months Delphi survey and then after that we culminated in Gonobi, South Africa. Um, most of the people there were doctors. I don't know if there was another nurse in the room. Probably I was the only one, but I knew there were a lot of pharmacists, and I wondered when they invited me to become part of the group, since it was supposed to be a global consensus for medical education, social accountability in medical education, if they remember that I was a nurse. But if they did, and they still asked me to join in, then that was somehow a recognition of interprofessional education. Perhaps I wore a different set of lenses. When people were not yet talking, talking about social accountability, I think the document of Dr. Boland was established, was published only in 1995. But our school was 40, established 43 years ago in 1976. Alma Ata was in 1978. And we were already doing socially accountable health professions education without the term social accountability. That term was not yet coined at that time. All we wanted to do was, we wanted to produce health workers for the Philippines who would stay and serve. Because most of our medical and nursing graduates were leaving the country, like 63% of the premier university of the Philippines was sending their graduates abroad. We were considered the number one exporter of nurses and the number two exporter of physicians. So the school that we have, I said here, we train health workers to stay and serve in the Philippines and not to grow abroad. We implement an innovative community-based, community-oriented, um, competency-based curriculum, step ladder curriculum. It's a career ladder. It was jo before that, it was jointly administered by, jointly established by the University of the Philippines, the Department of Health, the Department of Interior and Local Government, some NGOs and the communities. So 
our school from the very beginning has been an example of the academe, the health sector, the local government sector, partnering and collaborating to achieve better health outcomes and quality of life in the Philippines. It was established initially by these three organizations. We later set up three campuses. Our original campus was in central Philippines, which was hit by Typhoon Haiyan. Then during my term, we established two more extension campuses in the north and in the south. So as dean of the school, at that time, I had to supervise three campuses that were geographically distant from each other. I remember our chancellor would ask me, my, my nickname is Chichi, so he would say, Chichi, what do you want? Do you need a chopper? So later on, the establishment, in the establishment of our two extension campuses, this time we partnered with the local government units. This time it was the local government units that provided the property and the infrastructure plus scholarships for the students that they were going to develop into health workers to serve their regions. And then we also recruit um, practitioners as well as the staff of the Ministry of Health to serve as preceptors. Uh, this served to bridge the gap between education and practice. So where do our students come from? Our recruitment program is also unique. It's a way of empowering people and communities. So all our students are recruited and nominated by and from depressed and underserved areas in the Philippines, including indigenous peoples from the north and the south that are in need of health workers. There are no walk-in students. We don't have a student who comes in and says, I want to study here. Let me take an exam, and I, if I pass, I'll study here. Each student is attached to a community that nominated them. The community is actively involved from the time the student is recruited, during training, up to deployment and utilization. So after completion of whatever level they complete, the student is expected to go back and serve in these areas. We do not expect to see them working in urban centers where health facilities and health workers are concentrated. So everyone begins, this is our curriculum. It's a step ladder curriculum where all students, as you said, are recruited from the community. They may be indigenous people. They lar come from largely low socioeconomic status. And everyone begins at the level of the midwife. Based on need, they can progress to become nurses and ultimately physicians. In between program levels, between nursing, medicine, and midwifery, there's a period which we call service leave, and the students literally leave school and they go back to their communities to serve with the competencies of whatever level they have completed. Most of their training takes place in the community where they, where they interact with various levels of students, other sectors, and the community. So one community can actually have all students from midwifery, nursing, up to medicine at a given time. What's beautiful about this is that a student who completes the medical program or becomes a doctor is like a health workforce rolled into one. She is a doctor, a nurse, and a midwife. A nurse, one who completes nursing, is a nurse at the same time a midwife. And a midwife is one who has had the opportunity of interacting and learning with nursing and medical students during their training. I remember in one of the meetings of DINET, which took place sometime in 2011, and so we members of the NET came to the School of Health Sciences. And during one of our community visits to the rural health station, I think it was Dr. A.J. Nusi who asked the question. He asked the question. He was wondering what 
because the student that was at the station was a first year medical student. And so he was wondering what a first year medical student could do at the health center. So he asked, what would happen if a mother comes, who is about to deliver, comes to your clinic in the middle of the night? What would you do? She answered calmly, it would not be a problem because I am also a midwife. Our students were not the best and the brightest from the communities. We have a philosophy of universal education. So when they come in, like, unlike other schools who recruit the cream of the crop, we don't recruit, we, we don't base your admission on your high school academic performance, neither do we give an academic exam or an admission test to our students. Coming from the community and the willingness to return and serve were the most in fact, fa important factors in deciding whether a student was going to be admitted or not. As I said, they came from largely low socioeconomic status and we also had students coming from indigenous peoples of the Philippines. Today, our graduates have an overall combined retention rate of 85% who are still serving in the Philippines. And more than 90% of our physicians are still serving in the communities. Some serving there for already more than 20 years. Because of our innovative program and our high retention rates, the Philippine government actually recognized the school in 2008 with what is known as the Presidential Lincoln Bayan Award. Lincoln means to serve. So it's actually the highest award for service to the nation which is given. And our school received that award in 2008. So we have midwives, nurses, and doctors in underserved areas of the country. I see our graduates serving all over the Philippines in areas of greatest need as midwives, nurses, doctors, some are community organizers, some are sanitary inspectors, some are school nurses. We've, they, we realize, or population officers, we realize that they can perform these different functions. Some have even risen to the level of chief of hospital of district and provincial hospitals. They're not working in the big urban cities. We also had two people who were consultants of the WHO. Like, um, I don't know if some of you know Dr. Sumana Barua. He was a global team leader for leprosy in Sharo. First, he was with the Western Pacific, and then he became global team leader for leprosy in Sharo. And when, you know, when I talked to him, he's, he's Bangladesh, he's from Bangladesh, he said, Mom, the lessons I learned at SHS, I have been able to apply in other countries that are similarly situated as the Philippines. You know, he was my student before, and I saw his struggle, but when he became part of he took his doctorate at the, in Tokyo International University and you know, he said to me, Mom, you know, when I was your student, you gave me an NT grade. You know what an NT grade is? Needs tutorial. We don't give numerical grades to our students. We just give them qualitative grades of past and needs tutorial. And if they, we give them a grade of needs tutorial, what would that mean for us faculty members, we would have to do tutorial sessions until they learn the competence, the desired competences we wanted them to develop. Why did we do that? We didn't want them to compete for grades as in traditional schools. We wanted them to focus on learning the competencies that they needed to serve in depressed and underserved areas of the country. So he kidded me, mom, I remember before you gave me an NT. And then he showed me his transcript in Tokyo, which was all 1.0. And he said, in fact, ma'am, I did some of the lectures. So that somehow made me proud. It was when I see my graduates now, it's very heartening to hear them say that after leaving school, the training they had in SHS had helped them become what they are today. 
they would say, Mom, if you did not train us that way, we couldn't do what we do today. Doing multi-sectoral collaboration to bring about better health. From practically day one in the community, very young students, 16 years old, they had to learn how to communicate among themselves, with the community, with other sectors, as well as the politicians. They had to give up their shyness because they had to coordinate with various levels. So that is how, what our school is about, in brief. But I would also like to share with you another experience that we have had this time in interprofessional education and collaboration in practice. This was a program we engaged with with the Department of Health, the Swilig Foundation, as well as the municipalities who enrolled in the program. It was a program that was designed to train local chief executives and local health leaders in health leadership and governance. We have been working with the Department of Health since 2013 because we were identified as the academic partner to roll out the training for the leadership training for the mayors as well as local health leaders. It was felt that at the end of the day, what makes the six building blocks for health turn? Is leadership and the key to that is the mayor and the local executives and therefore they needed to be trained. The program aimed to create immediate impact on achieving the Philippine health agenda and health sustainable development goals by improving local health system in the priority provinces, cities and municipalities through improved leadership and governance on health. It has three components. The first is leadership development. The second is strengthening the health systems. And the third, community empowerment. The mayors or local chief executives, together with their municipal health officer, had to go through a training which lasted for 18 months. There were three modules with six months of practicum in between in their respective municipalities. Coaching and mentoring were done by staff of the Department of Health, whom we call as development managers, management officers. So going back to their communities after the training, they were guided with what we call a primary health care road map, which was based on the six building blocks for health of the WHO. So they had a task of strengthening their health systems through multi-sectoral collaboration and empowerment of communities. An important community, uh, component of the training was the application of what is known as the bridging leadership framework as a leadership approach to health system strengthening and increasing the community voice in addressing health and social challenges. Why the bridging leadership framework? It is because our health challenges and social challenges are so complex. They cannot be addressed by only one sector. They need, they're so complex. We have all the social determinants of health. They cannot be addressed by only one sector. And so therefore, it's beyond the capacity, as we said, of one sector to address it. And so we had to bring in, it needed the efforts, combined efforts of the private sector, the public sector, as well as the community to come up with resolutions, shared resolutions to resolve their problem. That is why we use the bridging leadership framework as a platform or the approach for achieving health, better health, health outcomes in the municipalities. So. It has three phases. Okay. The BL framework, for short, is an approach applied especially in addressing complex issues that cannot be addressed by one sector alone. It consists of three phases. So the first phase in the diagram is what is known as the ownership phase. Then the second phase is co-ownership. And the third phase is co-creation. A bridging leader must 
first and foremost own the issue. A BL does not see the issue as a separate entity to solve. Rather, he sees himself or herself as part of the issue and that he or she must directly contribute to the issue. The leader has that level of self-awareness and purpose that drives him to own the issue. To own the issue requires also for the BL to understand the situation through systemic analysis, formulating a vision of his own preferred reality, identifying potential stakeholders that can help him address the issue, and eventually make a personal response to the issue or challenge. In the second phase of co-ownership, the bridging leader convenes the stakeholders of the issue. Through a process of dialogue and engagement, the stakeholders are supposed to arrive at a shared vision and shared response, with the vision becoming the societal outcome aspired for by everyone. In practicing ownership, the leader is expected to lead change, which is the ability to generate genuine enthusiasm and momentum for organizational change. It involves building a shared sense of commitment to a common goal and utilizing interventions to help close the gaps or improve competence of staff to achieve that goal. Furthermore, it means engaging and enabling groups to understand, accept, and commit to the change agenda lead his multiple stakeholders, build and maintain high trust, develop synergistic working relationships across relevant sectors necessary to implement the change agenda, and also coach and mentor others for His is the responsibility of creating an enabling environment that will nurture and sustain a performance-based coaching culture. Lastly, the co-creation process involves a bridging leader being able to make new institutional arrangements among the stakeholders to address the issue. These new institutional arrangements, which are inclusive, not exclusive, accountable and transparent, lead to more empowered citizens and more responsive institutions that come up with more responsive out-of-the-box solutions. Empowered citizens and responsive institutions supported by new arrangements collaborate on responsive programs and services that bring about equitable health systems. The leader needs to champion and sustain social innovations that lessen social inequities. He should have the ability to challenge to champion and sustain conventional practices and approaches, generate new ideas and fresh perspectives, create creative solutions and strategies aligned with goals and directions that lessen social inequities. In summary, the bridging leadership process, after having understood the situation, the bridging leader makes a personal response. Acknowledging that he cannot resolve the complex challenge on their own, they engage stakeholders, including the community, to share the change vision and produce a collaborative response to the challenge. It is through this collaborative response, new institutional arrangements are created and outcomes are produced that are sustainable by continuous societal responses. When we started the program with the mayors in 2013, we had mayors who thought that the health sector was an independent republic and that they had no concern over the health in their municipalities. There were even mayors and doctor, uh, municipal health officers for political reasons who were not talking with each other. We met mayors who didn't know what is FIC for a fully immunized child. They didn't even know that there were supposed to be health targets to be achieved. The roadmaps that we gave them 
Initially, the baseline data showed that they were mostly red because the different indicators in the roadmap were coded, color coded. So if they met the standard, it was colored green. If they met more than 50% or 80% and above, they, it was supposed to be colored yellow. And if they fell below the target, then it was colored red. I will never forget one sad story I heard about a municipal health officer. We do what we call a final selection workshop as to which municipalities are going to be part of the training. And so there was this mayor who was asked how he felt about the malnutrition problem in his community, which was colored red in the roadmap. He couldn't answer because as I said, the mayors before didn't care about health. So he passed it on to his municipal health officer. And that was a very disappointing and sad answer for me because the municipal health officer replied, that is not my concern. That is the concern of the Department of Social Services and Development. Why? Because the budget for the feeding program is not lodged with the rural health unit. It's lodged with the Department of Social Welfare and Development. Somehow, I said, he's been in the service for 20 years, but he could not see the interrelationships, that malnutrition was not simply addressed by feeding programs. A mayor refused to allocate a budget for health in communities that were branded as his political opponents. He said, Mom, my roadmap will never become green because they are not my allies. He said, but if they voted for me, I would be willing to put in a budget for health even using my own money. At the completion, you know, he did not really put, but what happened to that mayor at the completion of the program? He was one of the mayors we saw transformed and from a budget of 8%, because the standard was we required a health budget of at least 15% of their internal revenue. His budget increased from 8% to 22%. And he, you know what he said, mom, you know I realized if I tend, still the politician in him, if I address the health needs of my community, I can convert them to votes. So it's still politics, but he changed his mind. He was able to increase the budget. So after the completion of the program, we saw health leaders, local chief executive, and health systems transformed. There was zero maternal death. We also teach the same framework to our students. When I got involved in this, I was, it was just something accidental. And so myself and another colleague is here, Dr. Labarda, we attended the training. We were not actually exactly participants. We were observers and I said, I fell in love with the concept of bridging leadership. And so I said, why should I wait for my graduates to become practitioners before they learn bridging leadership? which is one good way of doing IPE. So we talked with the Zwilig Family Foundation who was then implementing that program. That was in 2011. It was not yet implemented by the DOH. And we invited them to Leyte, to the School of Health Sciences. We trained all our faculty. We gave up our classes for a week. We trained all the faculty. It was not only that. We invited participants from the Department of Health. We've invited participants from the social welfare, from the provincial health offices, and our PhilHealth, which is the National Insurance Program of the Philippines. I realized that health professions education can benefit from using the same framework. In the ownership phase, students can be made to take a deep look into the values they and their professions profess. Critically analyze the health inequities and the role in its resolution and identify the stakeholders they need to engage. 
In the co-ownership phase, students can be made to convene the stakeholders that they need to engage. They're taught dialogue skills, no? different types of dialogue skills. Through dialogue, they come up with a shared vision for the health challenges faced by the community where we fill them during their training. And then in the co-creation phase, skills on creativity and innovation can be developed as they engage stakeholders in coming up with out-of-the-box solutions to old issues that have not been resolved by implementing the same solutions year after year as they went about their community experiences. In my talk with students and graduates and practitioners and even in the literature, the application of IPE has helped them develop both group and community skills and made them aware of the competencies of opportunities, uh, other professions and the opportunity, what the opportunity of working with them can bring. It helped them understand the importance of teamwork and communication. With shared responsibility, they realized that the burden was lightened. It helped them to see the big picture and encouraged innovation. It developed attitudes of inclusivity rather than exclusivity in addressing health challenges and issues. It transformed individual lives and communities. We saw leadership transformation among the mayors and rural health officers and transformation of their primary health care roadmap. This is an example of a primary health care roadmap that looks like a Christmas tree when they started the program into something like this when they completed the program. From red, yellow, green, majority of the blocks were now green and there was no red indicator. And it was a must because we believe this was supposed to be a leadership transformation program. It was a must. The first block there is leadership and governance. It was a must that for them to graduate from the program, there should be no red indicator in the leadership and governance block. From our students, it was very heartwarming. This is, I would like to share with you what some of our students says. They said, we went to the people, lived with them, that enabled us to understand their poverty. Oops. What was pleasurable was how they would change their ways. We realized they too had their dreams. All they needed was to be motivated and engaged. We taught them through interdisciplinary teams. We taught them group processes. From another student transforming lives, you know, she, he was a family, came from a family of 10 siblings. And so he said, when I was in grade six, my parents separated. For three years after high school, I plowed the fields, sold firewood and bananas. My neighbors would tell me, wala kang pag-asa. In other words, you don't have hope. You might as well get married. But after completing the program, he says, SHS taught him perseverance, commitment, and compassion. He sold sandals and shoes to the faculty as a student just to survive. I remember I bought two pairs of shoes and a belt for him. And he would cook for his classmates so he would get free meals. Today he is one of the two physicians, who, two anesthesiologists in the island of Biliran in Region 8. But what heartens me so much is when he says, um, my work is not done in serving the people. Without SHS, I would not have become a doctor. And, you know, there was one fun, funny story about him because he was also my student when he was still a nursing student in the community. And when he became a doctor already, he told me, you know, mom, when you made me teach the community about environmental sanitation, at the back of my mind, I remembered our house did not have a toilet. 
So now he's a do doctor, he's an anesthesiologist, he now has money. One of the things he did was he donated a parcel of land to the community that nominated him for their health center. But the funny story was about the toilet because he said, you know, mom, I didn't have a toilet in my house before, but now my house has six toilets. <laughs> He has a toilet for every room, he has a toilet in the kitchen, and he has a toilet for visitors. That really stuck to him. And then the last one is on transforming communities. This happened, our region is known for, you know, subversion, and we have what we know, uh, the New People's Army. So we have a graduate who's been there for, I think, almost 20 years, and this is, a community which can be reached by, most villages can be reached by horseback or by walking. So one afternoon, it was 3 o'clock p.m., Dr. De La Cruz was caught together with the rural health staff in the crossfire. Um, her midwives, she has midwives who are also our graduates. It's a very remote um, municipality. They were caught in the crossfire just 15 meters away from the rural health center between the military as well as the health, uh, the government, sec the military and the new people's army. And so what they did, they hid under the tables in the RHU, there were bullets crossing over their heads. Anyway, what happened was undaunted by those encounters, She's not from there, she's from another municipality which is closer to the center of the region. But despite that, she went back to the same municipality and until today she continues to serve there. I asked her, I meet her several times, she said, are you, I asked her, are you ready to leave? Not yet, ma'am. My work is not yet done. And so now she has, from the same municipality, they nominated another scholar who's in our school taking up midwifery. Hopefully, they wish they would, she would graduate medicine so she would go back and serve and take her place. So when she first um, worked in that community, 26, only 26% 26 of the children eligible for immunization were immunized. But now the figure has tripled three times. Another transformation of communities was also by another doctor from the north. What happened was he worked as an MHO after. And he said, um, my work in the community was not difficult because this is how SHS trained me. This is what they trained me for. So they formulated policies on health insurance, they improved their health facilities, their, they took away the kits from the traditional birth attendants. In the Philippines, traditional birth attendants are no longer allowed to handle deliveries, and deliveries should be done in health facilities by a skilled professional worker. When he also entered, there was only 20% facility-based delivery. And when he left, it had risen to 93%. He left as municipal health officer. Um, he went to school, and he eventually succeeded me as dean of the School of Health Sciences. So we see our own graduate becoming dean of the School of Health Sciences. He finished his term, now he has gone back to the region where he comes from, where he's doing family medicine. The world over interprofessional education has been, dis has been endorsed by various associations as a mechanism to improve quality care and improve health outcomes. But to be effective, it must be introduced early on in the curriculum and continuing into practice to best prepare our graduates, our future health workers, to work for professional teams. There will be challenges and barriers, ranging from turfing between professions. Luckily, we don't have that at the School of Health Sciences. As I said, um, I am a nurse. I became a dean of a school that runs a medical program, a nursing program, and a midwifery program. 
We only have one dean, but we have chairs for the medical department, for the nursing department, as well as the midwifery department. There will also be leadership buy-in may also be a problem, administrative concerns, logistics, scheduling of activities, increased faculty load, and even engaging community partners. In closing, I would just like to say the struggle has been real, the struggle is real, and will be real for those who would venture into this. But I say that it can be done. Thank you and good afternoon.